So, um, yeah, turns out Veil Wraith is really good. Veil Wraith is a solo adventure game set in Holler Nothing's Kill for the Universe, and while it does bear a little bit of mechanical and artistic resemblance to Gloom and Shadows, this system is entirely its own. Not to mention a slick, monochromatic look entirely its own, fitting because you are a wraith, a shadowy spooker navigating through the ether, overcoming threats and recovering keys to save the day. Structurally, this is a light campaign game in which there are five missions in the box that you will play through in sequential order in hopes of completing the campaign, getting upgrades along the way, doing the whole bit. But this is more of a story you're playing through by way of artistic conveyance rather than it being a strict narrative with story beats along the way. Really, each session is just new parameters for you to go up against with some minor deck tweaking with a maximum of five losses before you lose the whole ding dang campaign and have to start from the beginning. But that narrow connectivity is excusable on account of how damn cool this game feels to play. Every scenario is defined by the vignette, which dictates what threats will be mixed into the threat deck, what special rules this session has, and what bonus or upgrade you get for winning. Along with the threats, five keys will be mixed in at semi-randomized intervals, which make up your primary objective. Make it through all the bad stuff and obtain all five keys, overcome any scenario defined boss, GTFO, and you win. Lose all your health, which is called spirit because of course it is, and you lose. Every round starts with flipping the top card of the threat deck into play, and the threats are the denizens, the locations, the ghoulies of the veil, which make up the main challenges that you're trying to overcome. Some have abilities when played, others when defeated, and in true Kilforthian style, they aren't necessarily baddies. I mean, yeah, threat cards left in play at the end of the round generally drain your spirit, but some of these you're actually really glad to see. And you can make thematic connections as to what the challenge is representing as you interact with them, because overcoming a challenge isn't necessarily always a fight. And speaking of which, let's get to actually what makes this game so cool, and that's memories and actions. After drawing the new threat, you draw Memory, your deck of abilities, which is the main focus of upgrading throughout a campaign. These have a wide range of effects, from pumping the strength of specific actions, to healing, to manipulating threats, to general card game shenanigans. Then you get to take actions. You have three actions available to you that are how you overcome threats, obtain keys, and exit the vignette. Explorer, Fight, and Influence, and they are always aligned to power tokens, initially in your campaign as 1, 2, and 3. Let's say that Fight is under the 3 power token and you use the Fight action. You can overcome a threat requiring 3 Fight or less. Simple. But when you use an action, it moves down to the 1 power token, pushing the other two up, making them in turn stronger. By default, you can only use one of these actions per turn, but each turn you can also tilt a different action to add an expendable plus one power token to it, preparing it for the mightier challenges you'll have to face. As soon as you wrap your brain around this really simple system where you can make one tilt to for a power token and one action use per round, and that action swaps the positioning of the other actions in front of you, it allows you to do some really fascinating mental gymnastics in order to overcome the challenges presented by the threat cards. Add to it the fact that you can freely play as many memories as you want, but any two memories can be discarded to pump the strength of an action, you have a lot of tools in your tool belt. Which is important because the majority of challenges in the threat deck have a higher challenge rating than your max base power level of three. And then you add to that the fact that eventually you're going to have keys in front of you, and keys have once per game abilities, including every one of them allowing you to once per game take an extra action on your turn, and that just adds to the puzzle of what things you're going to do, what you're going to slide around, especially when you have a bunch of threat cards in front of you. If I play this action, this other action will slide up, which I can use with my key and this memory to take that action at this power level to also defeat this threat. 
The obstacles the game presents are really clear and easy to understand, but the limitation on your actions, the precious few memories that you're able to draw, and whatever threat might be looming just around the corner make for a fantastically challenging and super juicy puzzle to solve. After taking your turn, you'll take spirit damage for the threats left in play, then start a new round flipping a new threat and proceeding until all five keys have been revealed and acquired from the threat deck, after which a portal is put into play and you can escape the vignette with a victory through a final explore action. Turns go quickly in Veil Wraith, even though the threat deck may have you going through 30 rounds, i found that once you get in a good rhythm, rounds usually take under a minute and managing it remains engaging the entire time. Once you win a scenario, you get to permanently exchange one of your memory cards for another more powerful card, providing lots of cool options to sculpt your deck. And you also get any upgrades listed on the vignette, which can include more memory exchanges or even permanently upgrading an action or one of your action power tokens. These level ups are subtle and impactful and a great device that drives you forward like a monochromatic carrot dangling from the end of a black and white stick. So I'm not really sure what I anticipated going into this game, but honestly, I was pretty blown away. I mean, the design is really clever. It's simple to manage. There is a lot of challenge in the sessions. And for as concise as it all feels, you still have a lot of options at your disposal. And can we take a second to talk about art style? The game's aesthetic beautifully weaves into the otherworldly undead theme, and the art style itself feels haunting and gothic without ever stooping to a juvenile edginess. If there's one complaint I have, it's that the game feels a little too succinct. The five missions in the game are what you get, which leads to both a short campaign and you don't really get to feel the full weight of customizing your deck and upgrades from mission to mission. Yeah, there's an expansion out there with loads of additional content, but I wish more variety and maybe even an asymmetric character class or two to just smidge a connective story with branching paths was in the box. But ultimately, the reason why I want those things is because I like playing this game so much. And even without expansions or hypothetical robust in, in, the tight operation, interesting challenge, and great table presence has kept me engaged. This is a fantastic solo game and would be a great entry point for someone who's solo curious but just hasn't dipped their toes into the water yet. But beyond that, it's just a great game, period. This is my favorite title by Hall or Nothing to date, and I think that says it all. So that's our review. Thank you so much for watching. I've been Jack for the Cardboard Herald. If you enjoyed this video, we have all kinds of other reviews, interviews, and recommendations via writing, podcasts, and video here on our channel and website CardboardHerald.com. Our content is audience supported, so if you want to show your support, please visit our Patreon. Thank you so much for watching. This has been the Cardboard Herald.